action. Hello everyone and welcome to RBC at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from my office, which is located on the territories of the Songhees and the Squamish First Nation, the Lekwungen speaking people in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. RBC at Home started in March when our museum and archive were closed due to the pandemic. It was an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now that some of us are back at the museum, it continues to be an opportunity to talk to folks from the museum and to reach out to those of you at home or at school around BC. Today, I'm joined by Royal BC Museum Curator Emerita, Dr. Catherine Bridge. Catherine retired in 2017 after a long and varied career at the BC Archives and Royal BC Museum. Her knowledge of the art and life of Emily Carr is of special note demonstrated in her work as a curator of several popular car exhibitions and three museum published books, as well as the introductory essay for Carr's Cleewick. Most recently, she co-curated the upcoming feature exhibition, Emily Carr, Fresh Scene, French Modernism and the West Coast, which opens at the Royal BC Museum on October 22nd. Hi, Catherine, and welcome to RBC at Home. Hello, Kim, it's lovely to be here. When did your interest in Emily Carr first begin? Was it before you ever started working at the archives? Uh, it was the very first summer I worked at the archives as a university student. I was uh, sent into the paintings vault to do an inventory and that's when I encountered her work one after the other after the other and uh, yeah that was it. <laughs> do you remember the first the first thing you saw of hers? I think it was Sea and Sky actually. I think it was that oil on paper. Uh, sketch uh, taken off Dallas Road of swirling uh, clouds and uh, the sea and the distant Souk Mountains. Mm -hmm. I knew where it was, you know, being a Victorian and it, uh, it just uh, spoke to me. Yeah, that makes a difference. And you know, that makes, that makes sense to me. I, I had seen Emily Carr's work, of course. I'm, I was mentioning earlier, I was from, I'm from the prairies and I thought it was fine, but I really started to really appreciate it after I moved to the West Coast. Something about making that connection to space uh, and location really made a difference for me and something quite beautiful. And speaking of uh, making that connection to space, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. In 2018, you went on a research trip to France to follow, was it 2018, Catherine? Yes, it was. Autumn. Okay. In autumn 2018, you went on a research trip to France to follow in Emily Carr's footsteps. And today uh, you're going to share some of the images and discoveries from that time. So I'm going to share a screen with everyone. You'll see Catherine uh, still there chatting to you. And Catherine, just say next when you'd like me to switch the slides. Okay, will do. <laughs> So yes, I was uh, contracted by the Audain Art Museum in Whistler to co-curate an exhibit on Emily Carr in France. And there had not been an exhibit of Carr in France since 1991 when the Vancouver Art Gallery did a, a rather large show. And I was excited to do this because over the years I've been researching the more sort of, not really obscure, but the earlier parts of Emily Carr's life and I hadn't tackled France yet, so this was a good opportunity. And as we did the preparatory research for it, it became very, very clear that no one had really taken a lot of time to go to France and take a look at these spaces that Carr painted in and, and to learn a little bit more about uh, her situation and to link what she has written about uh, her time in France uh, to the paintings. And even more so, the paintings, as we developed an inventory of known works uh, in France, had very little specific locations associated with them. There were a lot of paintings that said things like street scene in France, Brittany landscape, Brittany cottage, um, but no specifics. Where were these places? So. I thought it was very important to start at the beginning and not take anything for granted and to build up new knowledge and uh, a more complete understanding of car in France. So that of course meant that I got to go to France, which was 
wonderful. Uh, my partner and I went and he took a lot of the photographs and I did a lot of pointing <laughs> and we put a lot of uh, kilometers uh, on our feet every day. So what I'd like to do is just take you through some of the paintings in the exhibit and some of the locations that we were able to find. So this first slide is just to give you a sense of what Paris was like in 1910 when Emily Carr arrived. She and her sister Alice had come uh, from Victoria. This was Emily's second time to Paris. She had been there very briefly in 1901, uh, well, for 10, 10 days then, and had uh, always wanted to go back to Paris. And she wanted to go because she wanted very firmly to become a modern artist. She wanted to develop herself personally and professionally and to take on something different than the way that she was painting. So she decided that Paris was the place to be. So she, she asked her sister Alice and Alice spent the last year before they left practicing her French. Uh, Emily Carr knew no, no French and did not have a facility for language and felt that uh, to try and do that would take away from her paintings. So she commandeered her sister to come and the two of them arrived in Paris uh, at the end of the summer in 1910. And this is the kind of Paris that they would have seen. So Kim, next slide, please. So uh, Carr, went to one of the two independent art schools in Paris that accepted men and women in the same class. This uh, picture on the left uh, shows the, the, the street and the front of what was then the Academy Colorossi, where Carr registered uh, for art classes. And on the right is uh, the same address in uh, 2018. Uh, and this is, this is what I did is I walked around and I thought, okay, we know she was at the Academy Colorassi. Let's see where it was. We also knew an address of where she and Alice had stayed. And so using that as a marker for what she might have seen traveling on foot, uh, we sort of went out from Paris from there. So next slide, please, Kim. So one of the first places we went to outside Paris was a, what was then a small medieval village called Cressy-en-Brie. It is now um, part of a larger municipality called uh, uh, Cressy-la-Chapelle. And it was very accessible in 1910, 1911 by car uh, from Paris uh, via train. And so it was one of the locations that she went to to get away from the big city and to feel immersed in the countryside. Because for Emily Carr, one of the problems that she had in big cities was that she, she didn't get on in big cities and she developed quite severe, excuse me, health problems. And she found that if she got away from the dirt and the pollution and the intensity of population into the countryside, her health improved. So cressy en brie was one of those places that she went to um, to help herself. Now, the reason she went to this spot uh, was that before she left Victoria, a woman artist whose name we have not figured out yet, uh, visited her with a letter of introduction to an expatriate English artist by the name of Harry Phelan Gibb. And she thought that this would be good for Emily to have. In those days, you didn't just knock on someone's door and introduce yourself. You really had to have the, uh, someone else set it up. And so people did this through letters of introduction. So when Carr arrived in Paris, she had this letter and she didn't know who he was. She just knew that he was English and he was an artist. So she, um, she and her sister uh, began visiting the Gibbs and it was through Gibbs and his wife that they really started to understand, Carr and Emily in particular, uh, what modern art was and what the art scene was doing. He provided her lots of advice and when the city of Paris got too big for, 
for her um, health wise, it coincided quite nicely with the Gibbs who decided that they would go to Cressyon Brief for a spring uh, session. And so what they did is um, the Gibbs set up household in this small medieval village and they had um, paying students. So Carr thought this was a great idea and moved from Paris to cressy en brie in the spring of 1911. So I've put this slide in so that you can see the typical sort of um, canals that intersect the medieval part of the town. And what was so cool when we got there was to see several of these uh, information panels that were um, in the village along the street. And the information panels described the importance of the town to artists over the, the centuries, really. And on this one panel was a painting by Emily Carr. And you can see it on the bottom right. Uh, it was sold at auction uh, in 2006. And it was described, I think, as a village uh, scene in Brittany. Well, the people who live in cressy en brie cressy la Serpelle, knew that it wasn't Brittany, that it was their part of, 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 of France. And so they uh, put it on their information board and added Emily Carr to the group of artists that they interpreted. So that was, it was quite serendipitous. So next slide. Now this was my first real Eureka moment. The painting on the right has been uh, known as Cressy en Brie. It was a, a lovely donation from a local family to the BC archives. I think it was 1982. And it was a gift from Emily Carr to the grandson of her old uh, clergyman. So it was um, a Cridge family descendant uh, to whom it was, it was given as a gift. And they kept it all those years in, in the family and donated it to BC archives. So when walking around Cressy en Brie, I had an iPad with all sorts of Emily Carr paintings on it. And I, uh, the methodology was just to walk and to look and see what I could find. And the first one that we found was this painting. And you can see from the photograph on the left, it is indeed the exact same spot. And uh, there were actual shivers that went down my back when I lowered myself down a few steps from uh, the, the roadway uh, closer to the river and there was an old uh, concrete, um, it was like a, I guess it was a sitting area and I sat there and I looked out and I looked at the painting on my iPad and I looked at the scene in front of me and I knew that Emily Carr had sat right there because the level of the water and the juxtaposition of the, of the trees and the buildings, it was all absolutely perfect. So um, my husband took the photograph and we thought, oh, aren't we lucky? I hope we're as lucky further on as we, as we searched. But it was great to be able to know for certain the exact location and also, uh, just how magical it was to find that. Okay, Kim, one more slide, please. Oh, Catherine, may I ask, um, we see some figures in the painting on the right. Are they <laughs> washerwomen? Is that the name? Um, well, I think they're uh, wives doing their family laundry. Oh. <laughs> and you can see in the photograph on, on the left, there's the remnants of uh, platforms down there where the washing took place. But yes, these canals were used for many purposes, uh, and washing being one of them. So it's quite nice. Uh, actually, thanks for pointing that out, that Carr has introduced uh, figures to give you a sense of scale and also to um, make it uh, the communication about what the function uh, mm -hmm. of the was. was. Yeah, it might have been a busy spot when she sat there versus the day you sat there. Did you sit there a long time, Catherine? Was it hard to get up and leave? Uh, it it was hard to get up and leave, but we had a very tight schedule that day. And I knew <laughs> that there were other places that I needed to walk in and spend some time. But because it was the first, it was, was very, very special. 
Now, these are the kinds of records that I was able to access and research about before I left for France. And uh, the letter on the left is the only known letter that uh, we have from Emily Carr written in France. And she wrote it to her friend, Nellie Cridge. And this letter is preserved in the City of Victoria archives. And the postcard on the right is one of several postcards that she sent back from her trip in France to friends and family. And they were originally, um, they came with a, a little ribbon around them and a little note that said uh, some old cards uh, when we were away or abroad. Um, but in this little um, stash of postcards, are lovely gems of information that you, I use to develop a chronology of where Carr was at this at specific times. So the, the, the dates on the letters, the dates and the cancellation stamps on the postcards, the location of where uh, the post office was and the content of what she wrote all went into creating a chronology. So I would have a sense of where Carr was at what particular time during her, her um, venture in France and be able to know if she was in this place before that place or after that place and how long. So these kinds of records are the things that historians and, and art historians use to, um, to learn about the past. And oftentimes they're, they seem quite insecure consequential. You think that you need some official record, but it's these little everyday personal um, uh, documents that, that open up car, her personality and uh, provide little details of life, which I think was really important in, in getting a sense in this journey for me for car in France. Okay, another slide, please, Kim. So from Cressy on Brie, that was, I did find another painting uh, in Cressy on Brie, but it wasn't one that went in the exhibit. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't included it in, in this showing. Um, but the next place I went uh, was to Brittany uh, on the Northwest corner of France, because we know from Carr's writing that after she left um, studying with Gibb in Cressy on Brie, uh, the Gibbs moved to Brittany for the summer and Carr decided to go with them. And we know that she went to a small seaside resort called Santa Flamme. And she talks a little bit in her book, Growing Pains, about sketching in the area and about uh, meeting uh, the various villagers and uh, the children in particular who followed her up the hillside and uh, were really the entree into learning more about the, uh, the peasants and the, uh, the cottagers in the area. So this is a scene just on the edge of the beach at Santa Flamme. I have no idea where she stayed other than the fact that she stayed in a small hotel and that the portions of food at lunch were huge. <laughs> she doesn't elaborate. Um, and my French was not strong enough to be able to go and visit an archives in this small town while I was there to be able to, to ask about which hotels might have been there when Carr was there in 1910. There's so much more work that could be done by anybody <laughs> to retrace and learn more specifics about this trip. But this uh, shows two buildings that could quite conceivably have been the small hotel. Mm. To Flam. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, a uh, question um, yeah. while we just have this break. Uh, Melissa's asking Was Alice with Emily the whole time, um, or did Alice leave after Carr went with Gibbs? Uh, she's correct. Uh, she left after Carr went with Gibbs uh, to Brittany. She decided that um, she done her bit for helping uh, Emily in Paris and she really only wanted to be in the big cities and she also was a, a teacher she ran her own uh, kindergarten school out of her house and she only had a certain period of time that she could be away so she left uh, car and uh, Emily continued on her own 
without her French. <laughs> so um, above the, uh, the hotel buildings on the strip of beach, I walked up the hillside and what did I find but in an abandoned railway, which uh, was just further confirmation that when Carr was in, in France, she traveled uh, the distances by rail. There was small rail lines everywhere. And so she would have gone from Paris uh, to this small resort by uh, rail. And now the rail line is, is gone, but it's a hiking trail. It's a linear trail like we know in Canada. And so uh, the two of us started walking along this trail just because it was reminiscent of being home. And uh, we were on the lookout trying to match up uh, landscapes that are titled seen in Brittany, uh, <laughs> that sort of thing, to see if we could find out where they might be. Next slide, please, Kim. And th these are the kinds of comparisons that we started making. Uh, the painting on the left is one in the British Columbia archives, and uh, it has never had a title. It the applied title, uh, the one that I think was given <laughs> it uh, in the 1980s, it was called a color, a study in color and form. And it is important because this particular sketch, which was never intended to be a finished work of art, she hasn't signed it, um, but she kept it all those years, really shows the transformation that Carr has undergone already uh, under the tutelage of Gibb. She has now become an impressionist artist. She is employing the fauvist colors, the colors. Gibb was a, an artist who, who was very avant-garde. And at the time she met him, uh, he was working in a circle of artists who were called the, Les Faubes. And it was, um, they're called the wild beasts because their colors were not realistic. They weren't natural. Uh, what they depicted was not total and complete and realistic. What they were trying to do was get the energy and the vitality uh, that they saw in nature onto um, canvas. And so Carr was learning uh, not to paint as she saw, but to paint as she felt. And so this example, I think, is, is very, very important. So on the right, uh, it's really hard to see because I'd have to jump off the cliff in order to be able to get the exact <laughs> angle. But we're starting to see that, yes, this is the country that she painted um, a study in color in form. And you can see in the background um, the distant um, landscape. And that I'm pretty sure is was painted somewhere above her hotel, somewhere along this rail line. Okay, next slide, please. You mentioned this is a progress. How old is Emily Carr at this time? She was 38 when she went to France. So she was, uh, uh, she wasn't an older woman, but she was a, a woman who um, had experienced a lot of life and had been traveling and sp she spent five years in England. So she was used to adventure. She was used to um, traveling to new places and to find places to sketch and uh, being in different um, environments than Canada. So uh, if you read the letters, the letter that she wrote and the postcards that she wrote from Brittany and what she has uh, written herself in her book, um, growing pains. She really loved the time in Brittany. She was there in the summer. The weather was glorious. She enjoyed the routine of packing up um, um, a meal and, and carrying everything up the embankment and exploring uh, the wilder areas behind the hotel. So this is another scene, um, again, from that old rail line. And what we were looking for was a prominence uh, that has figured in a very important painting uh, that's held by the National Gallery of Canada called Autumn in France. And as we walked along this line, this prominence that you see uh, 
is known locally as Le Grand Rocher, which just means the big rock. Uh, but this piece of headland, uh, you can see in the next slide. So there is Ottoman France. And again, couldn't quite get the same angle, but this is definitely the same bay, uh, the same land that she uh, painted in Ottoman France. The difficulty today is that there are a few roads in the area and a lot of long, long driveways leading to um, ranch houses, uh, farmhouses, and a lot of big dogs. So it's a little intimidating to walk up someone's driveway a long distance and then in very poor French, try to explain what you're doing. So uh, to be honest, uh, I chickened out a lot and we didn't quite get the right angles, but the difficulty also was that the vegetation has changed. This was very much an agricultural farming area when Carr was there. And although there are cultivated fields, a lot of the hedgerows have gone completely wild and a lot of the fields are overgrown. So you don't get quite that same vista that Carr got in 1911 but uh, it is the same place. And this particular painting is one of two paintings that Carr uh, exhibited, well, she submitted it for exhibit in Paris uh, later that fall to a very prestigious um, show. And the jury selected two paintings and uh, she had her first Paris exhibit in 1911. And, uh, this was one of them. So to be able to know that Ottoman France is actually in Brittany and is actually just outside Santa Flamme was, I think, very important for, for car scholarship and, and just to get a sense of, you know, what was important for her to paint and what did she choose to paint? Next slide, please. And just to let you know, Catherine, we have uh, about seven slides left and just maybe five minutes or so. Okay. We can go a little long if we need to. We'll go very quickly. So the next village uh, across the, the bay from Santa Flamme is a small a village called saint michel en grave And I was able to walk across the bay because the tide was, was quite low and to be able to get a similar angle that Carr had uh, got in 1911 where she painted the church and uh, the remnants of the Roman road behind it and the, and the hillside. So again, this had been described as a seaside town. Now, um, the institution that owns that painting now knows exactly where it was painted. Next slide. And the place where Hemley posted her mail from uh, Santa Flamme was a little village called Plessin le Gave. And I found this uh, location quite through serendipity. Uh, we had driven by a, a gated uh, cemetery many, many times. And on the last trip uh, before we left the area, the cemetery gates were open and I could see this calvary, this calvary. So we stopped and we went in and yes, indeed, um, this is the, the same cross that Carr painted in 1911. Next slide. So from that part of Brittany, Carr left Gibb and moved to, um, to learn under Francis Hodgkins, who was an, um, a New Zealand artist. And uh, she switched from oil paints to watercolors. And again, uh, these paintings had no locations on them. So this one is in a small village just outside Concarneau. And it's in a village, uh, sorry, in a, right next to a church. And on the other side of the church is the railway line. So uh, a good clue that the, of how to find more cars. Next painting. Okay, and this is in uh, the old village, the old walled medieval village in uh, Concarneau. And it appears that most of the paintings that Carr did um, at this location are in this um, walled city. So it was very lucky. It took, 
a, a bit of ingenuity because these are very narrow cobblestone streets. Um, and so you walk up them and you're looking for to match the, the roof lines and you walk one way and you, you get discouraged. And then you turn around and you walk down the street the other way and you go, yes, that's the direction. So um, here's one watercolor with uh, uh, today's scene. Next. And here's um, another view looking the opposite direction. And so again, it was one of those really shivery moments where I recognized the, the whitewashed building at the very, very end of the street scene. And as I backed up with you know, my little iPhone to try and frame it the same as, as Carr's painting, I bumped into something and I, I sort of turned around expecting to apologize. And I realized what I bumped into was an old bench at an old light fixture. I sat at the bench and there it was, the right height and everything. So Emily Carr sat on the same bench as I did. Another shivery moment, <laughs> next slide. And from that bench, if you just turned around, uh, there were three or four other paintings uh, that she, she sat at uh, the bench and, and painted, including this one. Beautiful city. It is lovely. Mm -hmm. And this is the last slide. And the last slide is, is meant to inspire people. There are several paintings <laughs> that I know nothing about titled Cottage in France, Brittany Cottage, Farmhouse in Brittany. And they often look like this. So there's still lots more work to be done. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's in France to take a few paintings on your iPad and see if you can locate a few more Emily cars for us. Thank you. That's wonderful. Catherine, is there also, you know, you had your, your uh, itinerary a little bit. Is there, a po is there a place where people can read about her time in France and the places mm -hmm. she visited? Yes, yeah, so accompanying the, the exhibit is a book uh, called Fresh Seeing, French Modernism um, and the West Coast. There are a series of essays in there, and uh, the essay that I have written includes uh, many, many paintings in addition to the ones I've just shown you, and you can see her itinerary there. Excellent, and we just popped up the, a link to buy that book in the chat window, so <laughs> hey, thank you everyone to do that. Um, and, I guess to wrap up, uh, we're getting comments here, but thank you and very interesting. What are you working on next, Catherine? What's your next project? Uh, well, I have another car book in the offing. Um, the Royal BC Museum is publishing uh, what is basically the last um, significant unpublished manuscript of Emily Carr that we mm -hmm. hold in the collection. So um, I have um, transcribed it because it was all handwritten and started doing the annotations. And so that is my next project. And I'm also working on Carr's contemporary, Sophie Pemberton uh, as an author. Wow, so there's more people can look forward to about Emily Carr. Oh. And, and as you say, the scholarship continues and, and finding these places and locations can be so important. So uh, not only an exciting aha moments, but also you must, it must also felt like an exciting moment for that scholarship too, to know you've added to that information that's there. Thank you so much for sharing, Catherine. Uh, and thank you everyone who joined us. If you joined late or missed something or you'd like to go back, this has been recorded and you will find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel uh, in the next few days. So please have a look there. The museum has reopened and we are ready to welcome you back. As is mentioning on October 22nd, we'll be opening Emily Carr Fresh Seeing. And you can find out more on our website and buy tickets, which are timed tickets we recommend uh, on the website. We will be continuing our at home, at home kids and at outside programs for the foreseeable future. And links for all these programs are also found on our website. Next week, I'll be speaking with the curator of zoology, Dr. Henry Chu who will shed some light on bioluminescence. So I hope you'll join us then. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves and one another. Catherine, there's some thank yous from Facebook here. Uh, Pat DeRose, 